Um, we're kind of excited because someone donated to us. Almost everything we have here has been donated or we've had volunteers help us with it. Anyway, um, we just got a collection of new mounted heads in. Now that might sound not so great to some people, but the animals are already gone. The heads are there and they're great teaching tools. They can teach us things about animals in different parts of the world. And you may have come into the Science Center and seen uh, over that way above the main entrance, uh, our heads that are mainly North American animals. Okay, uh, hopefully no one has motion sickness now from watching that image. But you see you know, the bison, the elk, uh, the black bears, um, and the pronghorn there. But we got some in that are from Asia and Africa now. And I wanted to talk a little bit about those today. They're up on this section of the wall, and we have a few more that we're maybe going to do something else with, but this is interesting. Can you see this one back here, the skull with the horns? Get a good image of that? Okay, that's a Gemsbach. Now, you can't really tell. We can't see any markings. We can't see any of the fur or anything like that, but um, it's got those long, straight black horns that are ringed. And that's very typical of an oryx, a kind of antelope from Africa. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's, uh, we're pretty much sure it's a Gemsbach because it's the only kind that's legal to shoot. Now, before um, we go any farther, I should probably note that, uh, now Carl, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but all these came from game farms in North America, correct? Uh, some of them came actually from Africa. Oh, they did. Uh, some of the, I believe, the Kamala and the Oh, okay. Now, it's become very popular among people that like hunting uh, to hunt at game farms. Uh, people will uh, that own large areas of land, especially in places like Texas with lots of open areas, um, will set up a, a restricted area on which they keep animals from other continents. And uh, people that are into big game hunting can go there and hunt those animals without having to go across the ocean and uh, deal with moving from you know, one country to another and dealing with another country's regulations and so forth. And it's all very regulated. Uh, I want to uh, emphasize that. But um, even a couple of these actually did come from Africa. So that's an Oryx. And if you want to look that up online, it's O-R-Y-X. And specifically, it's a Gemsbach, a kind of Oryx. Uh, they're actually beautiful animals, too. Now, another beautiful animal is right next to it. That one there is a common impala. It's a kind of antelope. Now, a lot of people use the term antelope, and it's kind of a catch-all. Um, I've read that it's, in one reference source I read, it was the term the uh, a wastebasket categorization, because it's their animals that are in the family Bovidae, which is a uh, very large family that includes, well, what they call even-toed ungulates. That means things that have split hooves, two, an even number, uh, two halves to the hook, and um, they include, the, the family includes things like uh, sheep, cattle, uh, buffalo, bison, um, uh, what else did I say, goats, and pretty much anything that don't that doesn't fall into those categories gets lumped into antelope. And they do share some similar characteristics. Most of them are uh, graceful animals. Uh, most of them are built for speed in one way or another. And they have typically have horns. Now, I want to make sure that it's different from, uh, you know, we want to make the distinction between horns and antlers. Uh, we have some mounted heads here that are white-tailed deer. I think we have some mule deer downstairs. We have one species of uh, European deer that we just got in. But antlers are very different from horns. Horns are generally hollow. They have, uh, they're made, the outer surface and the outer casing is made of keratin, or keratin, depending on how you want to uh, pronounce it. It's the same stuff that hair is made of, and fingernails are made of, and turtle shells are made of. Um, there is often a core in there, a bone at the base, but the horn itself is made of keratin, and it can take some pretty good, bizarre shapes, some pretty drastic shapes. Anyway, impala are kind of medium-sized antelopes. They're very fast. Um, they um, can run at very high speeds and they can leap into the air maybe oh, 10 feet or more. And uh, one kind of curious thing about Andal uh, impalas particularly is they practice something called stotting. Oh, what do you got there? 
We have a set of horns and a set of antlers. There we go, thank you. So I'm gonna be ready for the antlers. Okay, well, here you are. Now, if you can look very closely here, you can see, maybe you can see the core there, the bone core going up here, and on the outside is the keratin outside that makes all of this structure here. Fingernails. We just ran over that fingernails, turtle shells, rhino horn, that kind of thing. And antlers. Let's take a look at the antlers. Here's a little set of antlers. Antlers are bone. Now, around here, you know, people are quite used to seeing uh, bucks, white tailed bucks, uh, at the end of summer with uh, antlers that have a soft out, outer coating on them, called we call it velvet. And at a certain time, about this time of year, they're gonna to start to shed that velvet. They're gonna scrape that velvet off. That velvet is actually uh, the periosteum, uh, the soft tissue that nourishes bone. And underneath these antlers, solid bone. As a matter of fact, I believe it's pretty much established that deer antler is the fastest growing tissue in the animal kingdom. It, uh, it grows, you know, a deer sheds its antlers every year. And by the time it comes around to mating season again in the next fall, it has, could have a huge rack of brand new bone antlers. And then after a while, it sheds them again. Man, that must put a lot of strain on your system to build that kind of bone every year. Well, yeah, Carl just pointed out that uh, it's one of the leading causes for older, uh, older male deer, older bucks, because uh, it's a terrible strain on the body to produce all that bone every year. Um, you know, impalas and other uh, antelope have this interesting behavior pattern of stotting. It's S-O-T-T-I-N-G, stotting. It means they jump way up in the air and arch their backs, and then they kind of kick their hind feet. And scientists have been looking at that and trying to figure out why they do that. Boing, boing. And they kind of think that when they go up and they turn and kick their feet a little bit, it confuses predators. Predators don't know which way they're going to travel when they land. So they might fake this way and run that way. Showing off that they can they, afford they, to do something extra while running away from a predator. It might discourage some predators like cheetahs. Wow, didn't think of that, but interesting. Yeah. Okay, now the next one, there's two of them up there. You see them on either side, those the kind of dark furred ones with the curled horns. On either side of that big buff colored animal in the center. Now the big one is uh, called an well, there's number name for it. Uh, commonly called a Barbary sheep. Another name from uh, their native uh, habitat is uh, Awdad, or it could be Wadan, or Arwi. A lot of the common names for uh, this particular kind of wild sheep, and it's native to northern Africa. But strange thing, it's been imported all over the world for some reason. Um, people have imported them to all kinds of different countries. You can see them in Asia and see them in France. Um, I just saw a little video of uh, one of these animals um, that got its horns stuck in a couple of saplings and a motorist stopped and saw it off, off the road in the forest and, and this was in France and went to help it. So there are wild Barbary sheep in France, they're called mouflons. And um, as a matter of fact, that's one of the animals that's very commonly imported uh, for game farms and uh, it's a popular game animal for, for hunters. On either side are two hybrid sheep. Um, what happens often is uh, people, especially that own game farms, will breed a wild species with a domestic species or a common species and produce um, a hybrid which is neither wild nor domestic and uh, really doesn't belong anywhere except right where it's bred, but they're also popular, uh, popular game animals. Yeah. Particularly, yes, as, as Carl just pointed out, they breed them so they get those fancy horns that can get pretty big and look, well, look pretty spectacular mounted on your wall. The next one over there, that cute little thing right there between the hybrid sheep and the other impala, that, that one next to it on the right, is another common impala, is a black buck. Now those are native to India, so I'm pretty sure 
that uh, that one came from a game farm. And um, they're beautiful animals, aren't they? Look at that. They got those spiral horns and that wonderful facial pattern. Um, but that's another one that uh, commonly, uh, well, most native to uh, India, Pakistan, uh, maybe Afghanistan, uh, that part of the world. And those are the new ones we've got. The only other one we've got that I'd like to point out is this guy over here. Can you get a good look at him? Yeah, we can actually get a look. Okay, we're going to move the camera up a little bit. So this is actually one where we can actually move the mic far away. We can actually wheel this one over. We're not exactly Disney here. We don't have a lot of great camera equipment. But this is a greater kudu. Um, it's an African animal, African species. And um, I'm just always impressed looking at this guy. Look at the size of him, almost as big as a horse. Oh my gosh. It's one of the what? It's uh, one of the three largest species of antelope. Right, kudu. one of the three largest species. Um, one of the other large species would be is a greater kudu. A greater eland, yeah. And the what? I think it's the lesser kudu or the greater wilderness. I can't remember which one. Okay, well, yeah, there's. It could be the wilderness, for sure. The greater eland, the greater kudu, and a lesser kudu has different coloration. Lesser kudu has it's kind of a darker gray color and it has bands across the chest, across the neck, and down the sides. White, lighter bands down the sides. But they're all very elegant animals. And. Look at those fancy horns. Oh my goodness, look at those. Anyway, um, what else? Oh, one other thing I'd like to point out that's curious, and people have asked questions about it, but over there, if we could kind of swing over there and look just past the column. Yeah, yeah. can we see that? Between the white-tailed buck and the black bear head over there is a pronghorn. Now, it's often referred to as an American antelope or a pronghorn antelope. And um, actually, well, people have argued about this, but it's not really, shouldn't, probably shouldn't be classified as an antelope because uh, it's not really related to these. Now, one of the interesting things these days is that um, we have found out a great deal about genetic material, the material that handles it or that holds the genetic code that defines what kind of an organism, you know, we turn out to be or animals turn out to be. And um, because we can study the genetic code, uh, we've learned lots of different things that we never found out before. For example, when I was growing up, when we were in elementary school, it was kind of fun to, to look at pandas. We're going to study animals. We're going to talk about pandas. Pandas look like, you know, really cute bears. But we were told that, well, pandas aren't really related to bears. They're not like black bears. They're not like grizzly bears or any other bears in the world. They're not bears. They're more related to raccoons. And so we said, OK, they're related to raccoons. Now, later on, just, as a matter of fact, not too long ago, um, Panda DNA was studied, panda chromosome material was studied, and they found out, yeah, they're bears. They're, they are bears. I mean, they, you know, they eat bamboo mostly, but they're bears, by golly. Well, some people would be surprised to find out that one of the closest living relatives to the pronghorn, now the pronghorn is the only species like that in North America, the only species I know like that in the Western Hemisphere, but that's native to the Western Hemisphere. But one of his closest relatives is the giraffe. It's more closely related to the giraffe than it is to an impala or a mufla or an oryx or a kudu. Even though it looks like an antelope, it's more closely related to a giraffe. Anyway, um, when you come to the Science Center, please ask questions. And maybe we can you know, look these up if you're interested in these animals. It's really pretty fascinating. Just, um, just Google it or whatever other search engine you might use. Um, just take a look and uh, see if you can find out something about Oryx or the Impala or the Barbary Sheep, sometimes called an Audad or a Mouflon and or a Black Buck. 